Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, on behalf of the Nora Network, I'm very excited to welcome everyone here today, our speakers and our audience, uh, to discuss um, the the topic of the day and really, I guess, get into um, a great conversation that we're going to have today around transforming retail's future through next gen, next gen digital solutions. Uh, my name is Lydia, so I'll be your host for the day. Um, and I am the head of customer and people at Miss Amara, um, which is an online pure play retailer. We sell rugs online globally. Uh, so very excited to be here today um, to kick off some really great conversations. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. We are here for around an hour. So we'll have around 45 minutes of content and then there will be an opportunity at the end to have about 15 minutes worth of Q&A with our audience, uh, which we're really looking forward to. Um, so that's essentially the, the breakup of the day. Um, and just wanted to flag, um, like every Nora event, um, we're operating under Chatham House rules, which essentially means that um, as professionals um, in the room, um, we're really free to share lots of learnings and insights. Um, and everyone here is free to take those insights away, um, but just not sharing the identity or the affiliation of the speakers in the room or where that knowledge has come from. Um, so really just keeping the identity of, of that knowledge sharing private, um, but definitely taking those key learnings away. Um, so in the spirit of that, um, I am yeah really excited to be here to kick off the discussion. I think really when we think about um, digital solutions in retail, I think there have been such you know quantum leaps, particularly in the last 12 months um, around innovations in tech, um, things like AI, re-commerce that are really starting to change the retail landscape, um, both um, for bricks and mortar retails, um, retailers and online retailers as well. I think once we partner um, um, the changing tech landscape with changing customer expectations, um, you know, flowing from, I think, the customer expectations we see stateside in the US um, starting to become more and more relevant here in Australia um, and what those changing expectations mean in terms of customer experience for retailers here. Not to mention the challenges we've had recently um, economically and how those macroeconomic conditions are really impacting the way that we as retailers do business. I think, you know, many retailers have been faced with a mandate recently of, you know, innovate or get left behind. Um, and I think in the spirit of that, you know, we're going to chat a little bit today around how a commerce organisation can supercharge or transform their operations um, for a future of retailing that is robust, um, that is adaptable and composable. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm excited to introduce our panel today. Um, so I'll start with you, Piot. Um, Piot is a principal solutions engineer uh, with Commerce Tools. So really at the heart of the composable commerce evolution, Piot's worked with market leading commerce platforms in his professional career um, and is also a passionate advocate of great technology that is built simply. Um, which simplicity is as retailer something that I'm really passionate about. <laughs> so welcome, Piot. Um, next, we have Mahavia. So excited to welcome you to the panel, Mahavia. I know it's eight o'clock your time, so thank you for joining us at dinner time. Um, Mahavi is the practice director of the Composable CS practice um, at Royal Cyber. So Royal Cyber is a specialist CX and commerce consultancy. Um, Mahavi is also a veteran of many ma mainstream and composable CX projects. So welcome to the panel, Mahavia. Um, last but definitely not least, we have John Whaling, who's head of sales at Royal Cyber. Welcome, John. Um, John's worked across consulting, project and vendor roles in CX and commerce for more than 25 years. So a real wealth of experience in the room. Uh, welcome, everyone. I think to kick off the conversation, um, we are going to start by talking a little bit about current state and future state of retail and e-commerce platforms. Uh, so I think, you know, when I was thinking about this topic, you know, one thing I really love about Nora events is the diversity 
that they attract. And I think, you know, we've got a real uh, breadth of retailers in the audience from startups through to more established retailers um, and e-commerce businesses. And I would venture that whilst as retailers, our pain points are often shared uh, by many in the audience, uh, where everyone's at in terms of their individual tech journey, tech stack, tech solution journey is probably quite unique. Uh, so I think to start for today's topic, it would be really great for the retailers joining us, um, for you, Piot, to give us a bit of an overview of, you know, where are we at today in terms of commerce suites? Thanks, Lydia. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, all right, straight, um, straight to the question. Um, look, essentially, we have two main classifications for products in the CX e-commerce domain. Right, the first part, I'll call it the software suites. Um, they are en encompassing many components that have either been built or acquired over a long period of time that integrated with uh, other components to make it all work together. That's the theory, right? Um, the other set uh, is the component products. Also, we call them the point solutions or best of breed. They serve as singular or atomic functions like commerce, content, search, um, discovery, marketplace, and we can name probably a few more. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I think, you know, in terms of those terms um, around, you know, software suites and component products, I think they're all terms that we're quite familiar with. Um, I think it would be great, though, just to give us perhaps some more detail around the characteristics of these two, perhaps starting with the suites. Uh, sure. Uh, look, so software suites, they also, we also refer to them as a monolithic platforms. Because for a long time, you know, a single vendor would provide all the things that, that you need, right? Starting from marketing and through commerce, payments, delivery, order management, and all of that, you know, to deliver your shopping online experiences. Um, one of the inherent challenges with the suit is that their individual functions are standardized and cannot be uh, customized easily. So different business, uh, so different retailers then are using the same suite, they end up with the similar customer experiences instead of, you know, unique and differentiated ones. Uh, also, the overall management of monolithic, plat uh, monolithic tech stacks is quite complex. Uh, you know, the retailer has been encumbered with queue ch uh, changes, updates, upgrades, and that limits your ability to innovate and dif differentiate. Um, also, I know from my own experience, you know, performing any change in any part of the suite can be a really difficult task. Every time a new update is queued, you need to plan it meticulously, regression test it, and then, you know, your team is on call during all of this time. Performing an upgrade, you know, often translates in downtime and disruption of the business operations. Um, and we all know, you know, the saying, thank, thank goodness it didn't happen to us, right? The stories when, uh, you know, retailer side goes down during a busy period. Um, Javier, would you add anything? Definitely, definitely better. And top of it, yes, of course, we can't forget the homegrown solution they have built upon over that time as well. The build and buy where may also see the combination of both custom and monolith suits. The retailers who have built the system, they're often reluctant to change the platforms, partially because they have attached the system, they have designed it, and what does the work for despite of even falling into the system. They're also fearing of moving the another platform because they spend a lot of amount of time to build the suit um, from the homegrown platform from the monolith world. John, do you want to add something on top of it? Yeah, thanks, Mahavir. Uh, so I guess it's time you know, to start considering um, a gelling of the two compar by comparison, uh, you know, with the, either homegrown or suites. There's an argument there where you, whether you're getting best of breed uh, for each module and capability that's represented in the suite. Now, Gartner and Forrester, et cetera, have done many, many comparisons with these suites and they attest to them that someone's a leader. But as always, there's a counter argument about whether what you're getting is fundamentally good across the suite or not. You might even hear that the counter argument saying you're getting really best of suite rather than best of breed, which means that all the modules, when they're working well together, you've got a good outcome. A classic example where best of suite is not as good as best of breed, I'm sure quite a lot of retailers might nod their heads here, is in search and discovery. I've yet to see a search capability in any commerce suite on the market that could compete against the market leaders like Algolia, Clever or Bloomridge, for example. So it's just one of those differences where best of suite may not necessarily mean best of breed. Yeah, I agree, John. Um, I was just thinking about, you know, what we just touched on in terms of, 
you know, when multiple retailers might be leaning into or engaging with the same suite, you can get that homogenization of experience across multiple brands and then the suite, you know, almost starts to, you know, take over or, you know, embed itself in your brand identity in a bad way. Whereas I think, you know, that idea of, you know, being able to get best of breed helps you create that unique experience, which I think is so interesting. And and as you say, um, be able to plug into best of breed as opposed to having to um, mm. stay with, you know, a monolithic platform. Um, as you said, Mojave, that that idea of, you know, oh, it's scary to move um, that, I know, that I know a lot of retailers face. Um, but I think, John, it would be great to understand, you know, f- from your perspective as a consultant, you know, how you see this, you know, playing out in today's world. Yeah, for sure. Um, so if you look at today's leaders in the commerce suites, you know, most have been around for quite a long time and they've built up features and capabilities to cater for multiple requirements that on paper appear to be fantastic and they meet the retailers' needs. And, you know, when you go to one shop and buy something versus going to many, you, you might get a better out bargain or a better outcome. And these platforms are also built using software development methods now that were contemporary at the time, but we've probably surpassed them. You know, for example, Spring, with, uh, well, Java and Spring MVC, PHP and .NET, sorry to get all technical for a second, but they've been built in a certain way. And a lot of more modern technologies don't get built that way anymore. There's also the element of the, the features that are being built up over time may be long in the tooth, and you know, they're designed to work with the previous versions of another person's or another vendor's software, and that was subsequently updated and integration now doesn't work and it has to be remediated on a project. Now, I might be committing a heresy here, but in a lot of cases, what we're getting in a suite, especially one that's been around for a long time, is technical debt. So when you consider, you know, the architectures and development methods that we used to build, the system have fallen behind or out of date. Uh, it often takes a lot of time to marry a legacy stack with newer systems. And you'll probably hear us refer to headless quite a few times in this session that I'm sure retailers are now quite familiar with. There's quite a few issues with the integration between headless and headed applications. And it's not easy to re-engineer a specific module that's built with a web interface incorporated in the design to abstract that away and lose control over it and then allow that third party behavior, that third party application to take control. There's a lot of issues in making sure they work together. And then, you know, when what's supposedly out of the box is unusable in modern commerce deployments, those modular uh, components often get outdated and they need to be remediated during a project, which is something that the, you know, the retailer shouldn't bear the cost of. And so the other issue with your know, suites is that testing across the suite also takes forever because it's quite complicated. All moving parts need to be uh, tested, and particularly regression testing. And so the list goes on. So that's why I'm saying that you know, you, a, a retailer now just really does need to play due diligence in whether they want to go down the sweet road as to exactly how much technical debt that they're willing to take on board. You know, and why should you pay for it? Yeah, I think um, I agree with you, John. I think that idea of technical debt is something I hadn't thought about perhaps in those terms, but it's definitely something that I think as retailers we're all faced with uh, that we, you know, engage with a platform and, you know, for suites, you know, the engagement period could be quite significant and for other vendors it could be a shorter period of time. But I'm sure we've all been there where we've engaged um, with the vendor um, that we have felt stuck with or trapped in and and the idea of being able to get out of that can be um intimidating and i think some businesses are often forced to switch but then maintain contracts on you know redundant platforms because of of the agreement that's been made and then as you say then that technical debt and where that sits on the pnl as as a sunk cost basically um can become problematic over time so yeah absolutely it's, i can hear that, that that technical debt piece is something that i think we all face to, to one degree or another um during our e-commerce journey mojave did you want to um add anything there definitely definitely as john stated right there is a lot of problem statements as a suit based projects often it is taking longer time to get into the production as with comes with a higher cost and with less features which we have originally scoped by the customers because of the time and budget constraints 
the cost of the legacy platform is not only for the licensing and then implementations it's add up the additional costs such as upgrade maintenance and as you said technical debt if you are keeping tracking up this cost in multi year journey the many retailers have been discovered the true total cost of ownership of your legacy platform are much higher than the initially which they have considered as a budget right that's one further observation that is also important right the software suit vendors have the same issue when the, as the retailer because they have to build the platform and they have to maintain the platform as a suit they are trying to build the new innovations on in the model specific uh, which takes longer time and they have to spend funding on the r&d department to do the market research and create a new features going on and each features it will take longer time to come into the market because they go for a lot of testing is in progress and the suit platform itself starts slipping and other more innovatives in the vendors when a competitor in the market in the yeah i can definitely see that and then you know as as you touched on john then the suite becomes you know superseded or outdated and then as a retailer you know where where do we go from there um i think you know, i couldn't agree more with that that statement around you know the mandate or the need to be agile um in this climate at, at misamara one of our core company values is fast test learn adapt um and it's something that we you know use that framework as we approach any um any project or you know any new piece of technology and i think adding to that you know the current macroeconomic climate um it's more important than ever i think to be able to to be move be able to move quickly and adapt um to changing market conditions uh pior i'd really love to hear um from your perspective what the consequences are of some of these decisions here uh well, yeah, look, first of all, innovation is so hard to accomplish when you're fighting with fires, right? So you're watching your backlog uh, grows, your, initi your initiatives are stalled with the uh, upgrades that often take months. And particularly considering what Mahavir just said, right? If the software suit vendor actually has the same um, issues at his uh, company. So the consequences, I would say, you know, retailers and merchants are bogged down with laborious ways of working. And developers are busy maintaining the systems and fixing bugs, uh, you know, due to the introduced customizations in a monolithic platform. Uh, platform managers are constantly working to keep the platform running together. Um, and in short, you know, the innovations are stalled. Uh, you're waiting for the vendor to release new features, patches, or upgrades, mm -hmm. and they may actually never come in time. Is that right, John? Yeah, for sure. I, <clears throat> look, you could quite add quite a few more points to what you just said, but. You know, if we have a look at the consequences overall on the retailers who are on a legacy platform, you know, the outcomes can either be they meander along, you know, they keep going uh, along with the path that they're on, or they change platforms and re-platform. But if they do meander along in the same platform that they've got, the outcome, uh, especially when you know, their competitors are outpacing them, it can either be devastatingly quick you know, retailers who are unable to adapt to change their commerce platforms to suit different conditions, or well, those who can't afford to re-platform can go out of business quickly and tragically we saw that happen a lot during COVID. The other aspect of, of that too is if they do remain on the same platform, it doesn't matter whether they're small or large retailers, they can get so far behind in their technology investment that it takes a tectonic shift for them to transform. If they haven't got the budget, they can't do that, so they lose market leadership. So they get caught in that downward spiral you know, because margins are squeezed, cost of modernisation is too great to sustain, so they either limp, at, limp along or go out of business uh, gradually, which is again another tragedy. Yeah, absolutely. When, you know, retailers, you know, bread and butter and, and livelihood can be, you know, live or die, you know, by the tools they have. And I think we all know that, you know, particularly, you know, in my role as head of customer, um, you know, I work with a lot of customer facing e-commerce tools. And, you know, I think when we, we think about the importance of those in terms of communicating with our customer, you know, if, if that's not working properly, if there are issues with it, or it's not aligning with the direction that we want to go in as a business, if it's not supporting us through those times of need, it can become business critical very quickly. Uh, so, yeah, I think thinking about those pitfalls of, of some of those bigger suites that can't move quickly and can't adapt, um, is a really interesting point. Moving away from those monolithic suites, I think it would be great to start talking about component 
products and perhaps Piot, you could share with us what are some of the attributes of those component products? Sure. Um, look, maybe first let's start to consider, you know, a little bit of history and what has changed in a, in a five, let's say seven, eight years. Um, the retailing landscape has changed significantly. Um, you know, consider the services like 3PL logistics, marketplaces, uh, capabilities, um, and the re-commerce, which is buying back and sell on, on selling products. And of course, the big buzzword AI. Uh, so these e-commerce trends that we're observing, they're so broad and they go well beyond, you know, the retailer's firewall. Uh, into those third-party systems that yeah, you, you need to either control or, or to participate in. At the same time, um, over the last years, everyone would have noticed lots of vendors emerging into the retail digital space with solutions that we mentioned before, they address a single problem or deliver a certain service. And an obvious insight that I'm sure everyone is aware of, you know, Google's, Amazon, Microsoft, they definitely helped um, with their cloud technology that allowed those uh, software vendors to build modern software relatively fast and uh, cheaper. So today we know that leveraging those component solutions, also best of breed, to build your digital stack is called composable architecture. And those new vendors are laser focused on solving, you know, this one specific aspect of the CX architecture, like search or the management or commerce. But what is more important is how they work in a wider ecosystem of other um, uh, components. Is that right, John? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, just having a look at this in, a, in another perspective, perhaps, is that um, over that period of five, seven years, the component product vendors realised that they couldn't really specifically compete against the suites of the monoliths on their own. And, you know, quite often when it was a uh, certainly a big initiative at the uh, top end of town. So they started forming these associations, and uh, one that we're quite familiar with is the Mac Alliance. Uh, for those of I'm familiar with this is that the acronym is spelled M-A-C-H, which is the same as the speed of sound. I'm not going to go into details of that because that's not the purpose of the conversation, but just to, for awareness, the Mac is microservices, you know, it means component products need to be modular and service oriented. They're API first, that's the A. Uh, they have to play nicely together with uh, other composable and even, and even non-composable systems. They have to keep those APIs up to date. Cloud native, let's take away that overhead of running a monolithic platform and allow you to focus more on being a retailer instead of a tech stack manager. And then headless means that they also have to play very nicely in a composable ecosystem. So allowing the software that's better suited for a particular task to do its job rather than trying to take on and build out complementary features or capabilities in your own stack, focus on what you do best. So there's obviously advantages for a component vendor to build these attributes in these component products based on common standards and when everybody's willing to contribute that's where composable comes into it so what this phenomenon has done is it speed up the development of these platforms with new features and capabilities so really you should be definitely getting best of reach for each component then there's the democratization of ideas so alliance partners band together, they share ideas and bring new capabilities to market at an understanding rate. And we're watching new feature releases coming out of the, the Mac Alliance, for example, that would be two or threefold for what we see in uh, quite a few number of the suite um, developers. So then that fosters agility and adaptability because there's no encumbrance on other parts of the suite weighing down new feature development for the, the product developer themselves. And then you know, similarly to a democratization of ideas is that the problem shared is a problem solved. So a problem or trend impacting one composable vendor and may not impact the other, but yet they'll get together and they'll figure out how to get things done. So then because they're playing together, the testing of new features obviously has to become more rigorous than say with a sweet vendor. So they need to ensure that their products are working according to set standards and then tested. But that doesn't stop there. It has to be continually tested because if someone updates an API, they need to declare that across other people in the alliance. And so that then when it's tested, it's tested and integrated with other moving parts. Whereas with a sweet vendor, there's generally no obligation to do so. Although they may do that out of you know, good corporate citizenship or uh, good, good technical practice. So because these platforms are newer and all of these characteristics add up, there's less technical debt to deal with. And that's a really important significance here. 
So the result is composable vendors have been able to produce more individual cap capabilities at a quicker rate with far more innovation than with the monoliths. So that means overall retailers should be benefiting from the, uh, the collective rather than the um, individual. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that you say that, John, around, you know, the the rigorous nature of, of the testing involved in, you know, in these platforms um, that are, you know, more targeted, um, more, you know, centralised around, you know, a single um, value add or fulfilling, you know, a single, you know, role within your tech stack. Um, and the fact that there's so much technical capability that's, you know, leveraged out of these smaller platforms as opposed to having to kind of broad brush almost um, across a more monolithic platform. Speaking of broad brush, and I know that, you know, we chatted about this offline before, and as a retailer, um, I think often, you know, the first reaction or, or question can be, you know, how much time um, do I have? Um, is it easier for me to just get everything from one suite, um, like a one-stop shop, um, minimising, you know, the decision-making, the scoping process, avoiding change management internally. You know, I think that, you know, it's something that I hear sometimes on, on both sides. Of, you know, we hear it from, you know, suite providers, but then we also, I think, sometimes hear it from retailers who, you know, just due to, you know, internal pressures and, and sheer workload, the, the thought of having to manage, you know, a composable um, system can can feel overwhelming. Um, I think, you know, it'd be really interesting to hear from you, Piot, on, you know, how you think that plays out in a retail environment. Yeah, very good question. And spot on. I hear this <laughs> um, um, argument quite a lot. Yeah, look, so it's correct, right? To solve a wider problem with composable, we need to bring in more vendors, right? And then we have no issues with this, right? To see is to believe that composable vendors band together really well. Uh, and with uh, such a strength. So one of the best places to see the evidence how composable partners uh, work with each other is to go on you know, one of those um, composable vendors' website and check you know, the app stores or marketplaces to see how other vendors provide accelerators or what we refer to as a connectors into their platforms. Another example is that there are now customers who are uh, now composable ambassadors who can attest that they much prefer working with unified partners than opting for, for this single uh, throat to choke. And I guess that, you know, every retailer has to make their own um, mind on this, but we can provide great examples of this. And, you know, we can we can reach out later if, if you want to see some. Yeah, good one. Piotr, <clears throat> just for my thoughts, um, let's for argument's sake, uh, get to an apple to apples comparison. A band of composable vendors are lined up against the sweet vendor and on paper they're both equal. Now, the functionalities are apples to apples. If you look then at project times and the impacts on the, uh, the organisation, first of all with composable integrations with the composable web applications are very mature. It comes down to those microservices orientation and API first standards that I referred to earlier. So the supposed complexity with integrating multiple components isn't there. And we can discuss this a little bit later, I think, but retailers don't have to go into a massive big bang project to implement component modules. They just pick their fights and you know, priorities which capability they want to implement. They bed it down and then they move on to the next component. So for every release iteration, there's a short time to value realisation. Less complexity, risk and cost leads to a stronger chance of success. Now with monolithic, the main factor with the suite is that almost always you have to go big bang to implement it. You can do a large module first and then do subsequent modules after that, but certainly they generally do tend to be longer projects. So they have a longer time to value. It takes ages before the retailer actually sees the result in production, let alone for that capability to start paying for itself. Then there's also those hidden surprises with legacy components, the technical debt. So we've seen suite platform implement, implementation projects where, for example, B2B functions are quite old and they have to be either remediated or rewritten because they were designed some time ago and they're just not relevant. So in summary, higher cost, more risk, less likelihood to secure a positive outcome. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, it, and when we think about it through that lens of, you know, outdated 
functionality, you know, Miss Amara, um, we are on um, kind of year two of our B2B journey. So originally we're a D2C business, um, but yeah, there's definitely um, B2B products that we started looking at two years ago that are already outdated. And if we would have chosen to go down that road, we would potentially be stuck. Yeah. As you say, John, with some of those functionalities that aren't relevant anymore, but I think I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts, Piot, on what this actually means for customers who are still on or already on those monolithic platforms or perhaps like, you know, a homegrown or some kind of, you know, proprietary, you know, platform that has been built internally. What does that mean? Mm. Well, let's maybe to answer this, let's take a let's take, let's take a look at the start of the retailer, retailer's journey with a new deployment on on a monolithic platform, right? And you can you can clearly see what's happening. And let's be fair, there are some use cases when these types of platforms are maybe a better choice for retailers, right? We always say in you know, commerce was that composable is not for everyone. Uh, but essentially, you know, looking at the new deployment, the project teams uh, work with you know the commerce manager, marketer, customer service uh, team, and the tech teams to deliver the project. Right, and the retailer gets on the business as usual for the first six months. They bed down, and then the new platform with the new platform, and you know iron out all the defects. However, there's still a list of the new features that make it uh, the cut into the production, and you know move slowly up to the backlog. Um, if the organization continues to invest in the platform, these new features might get implemented at some point, but many will never <laughs> be. And then during this time, there's very little innovation, disruption, or other initiatives that gives you know the retailer any competitive advantage. And then don't forget what we mentioned before, like look in the background, there's already the technical debt that continues to grow as the platform becomes uh, more outdated. And then you know after go live, DevOps resources tend to have much heavier hands in managing the monolithic platform than they than they will have with the SaaS pure play composable platforms. And again, to compare it with Composable, the retailers generally spend more time with more and more resources to and, and also more tools to manage the monolithic uh, systems. Yeah, I think Would that's, you agree, that's John? Good... Oh, no, sorry. Please, John, yeah, you, you had a great example of this before that we, we were chatting about. Yeah, they're all good points. Uh, the one example that I can think of is that we're currently engaged with one organisation where for the last three investment cycles, has had to upgrade, upgrade their monolithic platform to remove technical debt, so it's security risks, performance issues, etc. And so there's in those three upgrades, there's been very little in the way of new vendor business product features uh, that can be targeted towards improved user experiences or shopping cart uplift or whatever. So there's no wondering that their retailers and marketers are frustrated because there's no new capabilities to take advantage of here. You know, all they've done for the last three investment cycles is upgrade. Yeah, and I think that that's a position that no really retailer wants to be in where they're, you know, stuck treading water is a bad place to be as a retailer, I think. So, yeah, that's a, that's a great example, John. Thank you for sharing. I think we might move on a little bit and I'd love to unpack a, a little bit more closely um, and switch gears into how a retailer can actually start transforming their their technology and their commerce future. Um, transform is a big word uh, and transformation doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and I also know that, you know, during tough trading environments such as these, um, it can seem like a big ask um, to, to try and transform internal systems and platforms. So I think perhaps if we could start with the basics, Piot, if you could tell us a little bit more in detail about, um, you know, composable in, in layman's terms, like how is it actually going to work for a retailer, you know, in their business on, on a Monday morning? Like, you know, how, how does it fit? <laughs> how does it fit into their business? <laughs> Uh, with pleasure, actually, I, I, I love that. So I'll try my best. Look, a composable system combines independent, interchangeable components that can be added, uh, swapped, and dropped at any time. Right? So that, that's let's say the definition. These components work well together because they communicate with what John explained, the API first approach. But they are essentially independent of each other. Right? So they can be easy plug or unplugged um, and play. Um, uh, you know the functionality according to your business needs. So this fully flexible approach you know, allows you definitely to maximize the benefits of build and buy as well, which we um, which we also love to, to, to praise, uh, whereby you can buy commoditized functions like cart, search, discovery, and then build what's unique to your business. 
Plus, also you get to choose with, uh, which best of breed products um, suits your requirements and your budget. So you're not being locked into you know one vendor's capability. Um, also, like personally, what I what I think worth mentioning is that truly composable system is not bound to any walled garden or proprietary technology. Right? It offers the complete freedom to select you know the codes, how to integrate, how you run the application without recurring to learn new frameworks or getting some certifications. Right? So in practice, you can you can uh, upskill your existing talent pool uh, to start working on this tech stack. Well, summarizing what I said, you know, composable tech stacks um, tackle the adaptability head on. Uh, so a modular interchangeable approach this modern that this allows you to select integrate and manage collection of tools and features that work the best for your business that would be my take on it okay no thank you for that that makes that makes a lot of sense i mean someone who loves change and and looking forward i think the idea of being able to to plug and play is really appealing i'm sure my dev team wouldn't say the same thing they would probably say slow down um but i think yeah, that ability to to be able to adapt is so important um particularly in this current environment so i think that's a really great summary of the the types of vendors but I think a lot of us would probably as retailers be thinking about the integration partners because I know that that can often be one of the biggest challenges internally. Definitely, definitely. The partner ecosystem adds another element to this. It is not only like in the composable vendors to ecosystem, but also implementation partners in the ecosystem that's in uh, that's playing the role as well. At Royal Cyber, we have built an accelerators and board of composable use cases. For example, like Commerce Tools, we have built an um, platform accelerators that will help to go to the market quick with our commerce sites built and customer service accelerators which is integrated with the commerce platforms, the customer service system supports buying and decisions and querying any customer issues. The marketplace accelerators to integrate the supplies into your own marketplace that you can on seller goods without overhead decks. There are ad other advantages of retailing capabilities that can be should be easily plugged in like 3D product visualizing, personalization search and product recommendations and express checkout on top of it. Yeah, I, like I, I can if I add like spot on my view, I think the SIs bring a lot to the table, right? And definitely, I think they they are the ones who dispel the myth about complexities of the composable stack. With those accelerators, you know, we mentioned, we have seen the implementations that took six weeks, but where on on average, you know, it would take around three months to start realizing value. And remember, the the, the most time during your implementations is spent on integrations, and and that's what composable solutions are really addressing. You know, the plug and play um, uh, solutions. Yeah, so I, th I think to be clear, um, like what I'm understanding is that you can do things quicker, probably not as quick as, yeah, well, quicker, <laughs> definitely quicker um, and cheaper on composable than on a suite. Like do you think that you can you know, move a lot faster as a business um, through to, you know, actually being, you know, live working with a platform? Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take this. Uh Essentially, it comes down to whatever metrics that the business thrives on, whether it's net present value, time to market, TCO, customer satisfaction, revenue uplift. And the analysts such as Gartner and Forrester and others, IDC, uh, have analysed enough composable implementations now to, to state that in, in, on, in almost all cases, the combination of agile project methods, for example, so it's not only the technology, it has to be the way you handle it and the way your organisation runs. The combination of the organisation, project methods they use and the composable t technologies is proving to have a lower and build, build and run cost in the software suites. So there's also no disputing that the retailer needs to apply due diligence in certain capabilities from multiple vendors than with selecting a single vendor suite stack. But to me, the rewards should be well worth it and well considered uh, because working with composable should result and sure to build integration and deployment times, you know, that leads to lower TCO. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I know to use an example from, from Mr. Mara, we invest a lot into project management internally. We have an in-house project management team that follows agile principles um, that works really closely alongside our in-house dev team. 
Uh, but I know that many retailers don't have that kind of centralized project management function within their business or system. You know, do you think to be able to, you know, make the right selections and, and roll out a composable commerce system, d- do you need to take a specific project approach like Agile um, or replace, replace different components in a, in a specific like prescribed sequence? Um I, I guess what I'm asking, Mojave, maybe you can answer this, is you know, what approach would you recommend that a retailer would take um, with a composable platform? Definitely. That's a good question, actually. In the composable world, it's just like an implementation, right? You don't need to undertake a big bank of replacement of your legacy or monolith uh, legacy platforms. You can apply one or multiple pieces at a time of depending on the budget, timing, and risk considering fact the composable architecture does not prescribe any specific approach when migrate from the monolithic and legacy platform however this this technology is extremely well suited and incremental even granular approach for example you just replace your cart functionality as we said search your content your order management platforms agile project methodology lend itself very well to implementing composable products if you examine the agile methods have been applied in monolith platforms still tend to be in big bank the scrums undertake agile development but this is stage catered in the planning development and testing etc the result is not much different previous way of managing the projects john if you want to add some top of it that should be great yeah sure so obviously big bang versus agile and you know agile is starting to um certainly um uh, leapfrog away from from those big bang type approaches so replacing component parts one at a time um, you know, you can also look at this in another way as chipping away at you know, replacing your legacy platform. You don't have to take a massive leap and just go, we're going to get off this within a year and then we're going to have this brand new shiny uh, system over there. So there's another, a software development concept that uh, you may or may not have heard of. And the first time I heard of it, I had to laugh and did a double take and that's uh, something called strangler patterns. So I'm sure the people can visualise this in their heads and start thinking, what's a strangler pattern? It's been around for a little while now, so maybe not so new. Um, But what happens in practice is the old system gets put behind a facade or an intermediary uh, layer. And then over time, external replacement services, you know, start replacing the the services that the old platform used to provide and gradually strangling off access to the legacy system until it's switched off until all after, you know, after all the modules have been replaced. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, John. I definitely double took when when we were chatting about this and sent through uh, your notes too. But I think that it's probably something, you know, a lot of retailers think about is, okay, you know, we know that we need to move or we want to move away from this, you know, monolithic platform, but how do we do it in a way that's not going to impact our customer or that's not going to ha- result in downtime? I think that's one of our biggest fears as well. Um so what does that look like? So I think that that, that answers one question that I had. Um, I think in my role and, and scoping in new, new platforms, you know, particularly, you know, in the B2B space and customer space that I've been working in lately, um, you know, looking at different UX solutions and, you know, solving some problems we have or, or on site or trying to um, optimise, you know, our journey on site, um, we do come across, you know, some of those bigger guys who, say that they are composable or or market their product in a way that's composable. Uh, So I I guess my question is, as someone who's not embedded in this space is, is the concept of composable commerce just part of, you know, the evolution of software development and and the way that these these bigger guys are positioning their product? Ah, I can take that one. Um, look, it was an interesting experience uh, to see the so-called evolution when working with four different vendors over the last decade. Um, and, and let's take an example of the headless commerce, which everyone is familiar with, right? Um, you know, again, everyone who operates now within the digital e-commerce uh, ecosystem is well, ref- well, well aware that embracing headless is the only way to move the business forward in our constantly changing world, right? So. Yeah, not all the headless or composable solutions are created equal. In fact, some companies have tried to capitalize on the hype without committing to being true in headless or composable. Uh, the businesses that fall for the hype uh, are vulnerable to impeded revenue growth. 
as part of the com commerce tools, I actually have this mission to highlight and explain the key traits of composable systems, which in short uh, would be cloud native um, that allows you for exceptional scalability and resilience, component based. And what it really means is that you can only use the part of the solutions that you really need. You don't need to take the full platform uh, and, and use it from you know A to Z. And what I mentioned before, tech agnostic, right? So it gives you this freedom of engineering. You can build your business specific requirements with cloud-based tools outside of the vendor's platform. So you're not incurring this technical debt. And again, if, vendor, if the vendor you're looking at does not share all this straight, then it's definitely not composable and you'll miss out on some of the benefits of this architecture. John, would you add some, something? Yeah, uh, Piotr, you and I have worked before together in a, in a vendor role and you now now taken a different uh, lens to it with a consultancy. Um, and in my experiences across the 25 years, you know, and more so lately, I've seen Vendors produce white papers, and recently you'll see them popping up. They've, we've got we've got headless, or we've got composable. Essentially, staking a claim of we've got one too. Yet in re-engineering their products, they really haven't embraced composable principles at all, or even adhered to any of the associated standards. So just because a vendor says they've got the capability in headless, whatever it is, doesn't change the fact that they're still a monolith. You know, they can still essentially. Uh, there's still essentially a suite of modules that work best with each other and then become challenged when you try and introduce a third wheel into the mix. Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense, John. And I think something that we spoke about offline too is that the level of concern that some retailers may have around, you know, how do I know that I'm choosing the right platform or how, how do I know that I'm choosing the right solution, you know, within a composable ecosystem? Um, so, and maybe Mojave, you can answer this one. Um, how can the retailer be sure that the future that they're investing in is sound? Definitely, that is a valid question. Really, actually, yes, we are talking about a lot of components plays in the role, uh, but how the retailers can be evaluated and fit together, right? So, to to overcome this, the standard bodies like Mac Alliances is one of the example. They're providing the tank basis, ensure all these vendors and deliver what they're promising on these solutions. The strong incentive and commitment to these alliance members to play nicely together to ensure these platforms delivers as he promised. There are more incentive in intercompany innovations that compete against the suits. The idea for problem solving we refer to means there is n times greater thinking power, faster innovation, and higher likelihood. The customer new features requests will be taken on board. Just should, that, that should be a best in breed and new ideas and solution. Agility and adaptability, a problem shared and problem solved. Less technical debt on to deal with this. The result is composable vendors have been able to produce more individual capabilities, quicker rate with far more innovations with the monoliths, where the retailers can't able to spend time in this R&D spaces. There are the partners al along who along with these vendors at Royal Cyber, as I said earlier, we are the huge fans of building and accelerators and speed up the implementation process. For example, simply like our market pit solutions, which have played with our commerce platform, marketplace and service management team system to make sure the sales go smoothly across all three PL networks from the supplier retail to the end customer. No, they're, they're good points. Again, um, I just do want to add another facet to this, and that is you know, when you're acquiring a new technology capability, the retailers generally undertake sound due diligence when they're acquiring the capability because it's a big investment. It doesn't matter whether it's a suite or whether it's composable. Well, I do think there's an element lacking in RFPs that I think that should be considered. Now, I've been, as we said earlier, you know, on the, the customer side, the consulting side and the vendor side, and so I know how to play an RFP in e either circumstance. The element that I th do think is missing in a lot of RFPs that should be considered is, is not only to ask, do you have one, does it work? What degree of complexity is it going to take to implement? There are some questions that the retailer should ask the suite vendor or the, any vendor really during the acquisition phase is how long has a particular module been in production and then how often or when was the last time it was updated? And does it work in a new way like in a headless fashion or does it work with component A, B, C or um, does it work with the most recent versions of these external systems? So these are simple things that retailers could put into a column in their RFP requirement spreadsheet and then they um, make sure that 
you know, they're, they're asking these questions. And I, I have no doubt that you're going to see some very interesting answers from vendors in those responses. They're either going to declare that their software is fit for purpose and meets those requirements, or you're going to see some obfuscations and vague answers to cover up the legacy elements of their software. So it's, I guess it's just a tip for retailers, for retailers to consider. Thanks, John. I think that those, you know, kind of critical questions are, are so important. It's a bit of a cheat sheet, really, I think, in terms of what you should be going to your vendor and asking. Um, I think while we're on the topic of questions, I did just want to shout out to the audience and, and please encourage everyone um, to put questions in the question box um, so we can facilitate Q&A at the end of the session. So if anyone has any questions around the discussion, please uh, pop them in as we go. Um, I am conscious of time, um, but I did just want to touch um, on um, our last topic uh, before we head into the Q&A, um, just around um, digital transformation and, and how it happens. I think given the permeation of generative AI into the market, I know, you know internally at Misamara, um, we are considering how this is going to impact our current digital products. Um, and, and we're also to a degree looking to our existing providers for what in innovation they're going to to deliver in this space. Um, but I think, you know, for the panel who is really immersed in commerce technology, I would love to hear from you guys about what you think the retail future could look like um, in terms of e-commerce. Piotr, did you want to start? Uh, sure. Look, and, and conscious of time, I, I would just probably list this, what is on top of my head and what we're looking at even internally at, at commerce tools, right? You will see things like biometric payments coming in into the play, right? So imagine walking in a store, selecting your items, and then completing the entire process with just wave of your hands. Generative AI, I think that's, that's obvious these days, right? How we use it and it has tremendous effect already in e-commerce. AR and VR, right? They did, they, they, the new ways that, you know, the customers can shop and interact with the products in the digital space. Point is, like almost every quarter now, we're observing a new technology emerging into the market, right? And it's not slowing down. Actually, with the AI, it'll be it'll be actually even faster to create new tech. This is why it's so important. And what we're trying to say is to invest in the best architecture that and the technology that will allow you to leverage um, these new services. Try them in your own environment with your customers, and if it fails and it's not adopted, just simply shut it down and do not ruin your budget. And I think, in my opinion, this is the holy grail in the retail stack. I'd be able to implement new services fast at low cost with a low risk. Yeah, it definitely sounds very exciting. Um, what about the impact if AI goes wrong, John? <laughs> yeah, you, you can all, all see those scary uh, movies, can't we? <laughs> um, yeah, Tom Cruise and such. Um, you know, the you know the candidate capability. Um, such as AI, you know, when you look at the component vendor ecosystem, if you're considering that the retailer is already on that composable platform, but I guess the same could be said uh, for a suite as well, but the capability should already have been tested rigorously in the vendor ecosystem and then productized, you know, so that it works, you know, on a composable tech stack. Then when the real retailer integrates and implements this new capability, it should be quicker uh, because that's what we're arguing here today. And you're able to test and run it in an alpha beta trial, um, even going to full production with A-B testing and other things you can switch on. You should then also be able to unwind the implementation and revert the previous version pretty quickly. Uh, so this should be within weeks. And, you know, sometimes when real retailers do get it wrong, you know, they should always say sorry and look to the turn the negative into a positive. And I'm sure that there are many crafty marketers and copywriters in this session, you know how to pull a rabbit out of a hat and turn a uh, pretty ugly story into a funny story or a good one, something that's endearing to humans. Yeah, I agree with that, John. I think that, you know, most of us retailers who have been through COVID had to pull a fair few rabbits out of lots of different looking hats that we've probably never encountered before. Um, so, yeah, I think there's always that capability internally to speak um, authentically to your customer about the challenges that you're having as a business. And I think if you have an engaged customer and, and you're doing the work on that side, then I think you've got that bandwidth to be able to, yeah, have that human element Um alongside the tech and say, look, you know, we're sorry. Um, we were trying to make something better for you and it didn't work the way we wanted it to, um, which is not a conversation anyone wants to have, but I think if you position it the right way, it's definitely possible. I think what I'd be interested to understand is do you think that this is 
going to result in different and new ways of working? Piotr, maybe you can answer that one. Well, yeah, clearly, yes, right? For both uh, business and IT. Like, um, in, from the business perspective, you get new capabilities and new toys to work with. You know, remember, we're talking about the best of breed solutions when we talk about composable, so, uh, right? So that not only helps to retain the talents within your organizations, but quite often we see it sparks the new ideas of how those tools are used to differentiate. And then my favorite when it comes to IT, working with composable cloud-based stack, it just unleashed the whole new way of working, right? In most cases, it's actually easier to manage um, and requires less, less resources with the lower risk in development. We have noticed that then IT is now focused on innovation rather than maintenance. Definitely better. As I said, like this will comes with more on delivery side, right? It is increase the speed of the delivery. And there is no concerns on the framework and no builds and redeployments of the whole tech stack. Uh, if you remember the holder days in one sprint, it will sit in the month, get up a lot of features packed together and ready to go for productions. But considering the composable world, these are all will be done. We can do it in the very speed and incremental way. The teams can work on the capabilities rather than the products in the model, allowing them to independent and innovate their own solutions not being restricted for the underlying technology aspect. So they're not depend, not depending on the technology as an aspect. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, Mojave. Um, and I think probably segues really nicely into one of the questions that's come through the question box. Um, so I might kick into the Q&A now um, and put it to the group. Um, the question is, how can retailers fail fast on a composable tech stack? Um, and do you have any key tips to help test and try? Does anyone want to answer that one? Oh, you can take that first, Piotr. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, um, how we can fail fast um, is because of the underlying tech stack, right? Uh, as I try to um, explain, uh, within composable and composable vendors, uh, the way you build and you work and you customize and you integrate, you're leveraging the cloud stack and the cloud tools, as I prefer um, to call it, which means that development is, is fast, development is way easier and not burdened with a lot of risk. Therefore, bringing some new product new service into your stack does not require six months, you know, three months of planning and six months of development. Therefore, I, I see this as a way, you know, you can build fast and you can fail fast, turn it off if you don't like it and you don't spend a year, you know, to, to bring in new service that actually your customers don't use on the end. Okay, I think that's a great answer. Did anyone want to add to that, John or Mojave? Oh, yeah, very quickly, you know, um, well, we do this for our customers, you know, providing sandboxing and prototyping capabilities where they can actually, you know, get our expert opinion, I guess, into how things will work and just to make sure that they're thinking of all of these things through. Because yeah, when a retailer does things once, you know, any consultants really has done it a dozen times on the very many projects that they work on. So there's always that as well. And, you know, that's the beauty of um, being on a, um, a uh, SaaS platform to these things can so easily be set up for you. Thanks, and, also, yeah. and also it's allowed the retailers to experiment their own platforms, right? With this composable world, they can add new components and test it that may have yeah. a risk in factors. Sometimes it may be work, sometimes it may be <laughs> fail for them also. That should be the risk they have to carry. Yeah, I think so. And, and it's, it does se certainly sounds like that that failing fast is possible, but I think, you know, still feels a little bit painful, um, you know, at the time when you think about it. But if it's easy to fail fast and then get back up again, I think that that definitely gives a level of comfort um, and that you can have those kind of guardrails, as you touched on, John, with things like sandboxing that, you know, make the testing phase you know, it, it gives everyone a level of comfort, I guess, around that testing period. Um, speaking of pitfalls, I think the other question that's come through um, is uh, to the group, what other pitfalls do you see when companies RFP their digital platforms or get on the AI bandwagon? I bet the farm on it. <laughs> um, you know, I read a very good article um, not even six months ago with um, ChatGPT emerging. And by the way, um, I wrote an email to my boss that was meant to go from him to the customer and then he put it through ChatGPT and he did a better, better job than, than I am, so I'm frightened of my job. But um, 
yeah, AI is, is, as we all know, is, is starting to get a little bit scary, but still capabilities uh, just coming out of what I understood the, the writer or the author of this piece to say it's coming out of the nation stage. You know, it's like we went to toddler, we're starting to get a little bit more mature, it's now starting to mature. I think there's a long road to go before you can have an AI controlled uh, retail uh, experience. You know, we still need savvy marketers and savvy retailers. And and I just add one more point on top of John. So basically, like as we in composable world, the each small platforms like a content systems or search systems, they can do their own innovations and they're bringing the AI concepts as part of the solutions, right? Those APIs. Mm. For example, personalization search, it is coming there. In CMS world, you can generate your product descriptions, meta information, and digital assets. And you can, it will ask a prompt. You can say, hey, I want this. Then the CMS engine now is capable of generating this. That is the benefit they can get. The retailers get real time when you go in this world. As we said in the previous questions, also fall under it. It's an experiment. Sometimes it may be fine. Sometimes it may be a pass. So that risk we need to carry. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing those insights. Uh, I think I'm conscious of time. We're um, at the top of the hour. So I just wanted to um, throw back to the panel for any key takeaways and final words to wrap up the session. Yeah, I might start. Uh, look, I would summarize this with saying actually what we didn't focus that much. We talk a lot about tech and software and vendors, but we forgot about the people, right? So I would say it's, it's also about the retention of your talent in, in your businesses, right? This has become more and more important since the pandemic. Um, and, you know, giving your, your team the tools and opening the opportunities to innovate and contribute to the success of, of your business should be also a top priority and we should not forget about it. I'll have you over to you. Definitely, but yeah, on top of it, in a nutshell, the change is like a constant, as we said, because right, and the innovation is an essential today's in the world. The composable approach, uh, approach offers a steady compass, it guides the business not only towards the competitiveness but also towards the creation of through a new ecosystems growth in the nature and the transformation is celebrated. So that's where, like, they can adapt all the new features, what's going on in the market. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, you know, if we'd steal a, a, um, a leaf out of the AI playbook as well, revolutions don't happen um, slowly, they happen quickly. That's why they're called revolutions. And so, you know, I like to look at this as FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. If you don't have a fear of missing out, you know, when other retailers are uncomposable and embracing these technologies and are moving at a faster innovation than you are, then I think you'd better go out and get some FOMO. Um, in fact, I just registered a quick donate main name, getfomo.com.au. So it's a poor sales guy's attempted a joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. I love that. I love the retailers sitting in the room having foam over other retailers' tech stacks. I think that that's, that's very true. And he's on, online now checking out domain registration names. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Piot, Mojave and John um, for your time today. I um, also wanted to thank uh, the wonderful Nora Network um, for uh, making this event possible, Gareth, Ellie, Anna um, and the entire Nora team. Um, and thanks to our incredible audience for your attendance today. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, wonderful thank to you. be uh, part of the uh, um, panel today. Really appreciate the, uh, the honour. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.